newspaper. At the beginning of last year, we were beginning to see signs of another energy downturn. Also, there was something going on over in Asia that started to make the news. But it wasn't still until it started showing up at Italian ski resorts did we all begin to get a little anxious. Of course, you all know how the rest of this story plays out. And it resulted in a whiplashing of local, national, and global economies as businesses around the world shut down and millions of people lost their jobs. As we seem to be on the backside of this pandemic, many parts of the economy have largely recovered, yet some of it continues to look a little dire. Regardless of the odd shape of the recovery, our lives most certainly look to be a bit different than a year ago. Our next pre presentations will be from our veteran economists who are here to shed some light on the post-pandemic economy. Okay, before you go any further, I have an unfortunate announcement. We have a little change in today's agenda. As you all know, we have always have two economists lined up for our, for our forecast. But our perennial guest, Patrick Jankowski with the Greater Houston Partnership took a spill and broke his leg. He will not be with us today while he is at home recovering from surgery. And the last thing you all want is an economist hopped up on pain meds trying to explain the inverted yield curve on treasury bonds. For all we know, it could result in the next stock market crash. We will miss you, Patrick, and we wish you a speedy and full recovery. So here to pick up the slack is our second economist presenter, Mark Wynn. Mark is a vice president, associate director of research and director of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas's Global, Globalization Institute. We are excited to have Mark with us today because he brings a world's view to our local perspective. I know it is cliche, but the world is getting smaller. The pandemic has been a global event. Our economies are globally linked and nothing can be truer for Houston. Mark has been a mainstay with the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas for multiple decades, advising the bank on inflation measurement, drivers of business cycles, the regional impact of global shocks and more. His work has appeared in many leading peer reviewed academic journals and Federal Reserve publications. Mark has taught at the University College of Dublin, the University of Rochester, Southern Methodist University and the University of Texas at Dallas. He co-edited the volume, The Federal Reserve's Role in the Global Economy, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. Mark earned his bachelor's and master's at the National University of Ireland, University College, Dublin, and holds a master's and PhD degrees in economics from the University of Rochester. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Wynn. Thank you very much for that introduction. I assume you can hear me. Okay, now next technical challenge is to share my screen. Is that visible? Yeah. So, um, uh, before I start, uh, well, first, let me uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to your group uh, today. Uh, actually, it's been quite a while since I've done one of these uh, public speeches. Um, so uh, apologies if I'm a bit rusty. Um, I also need to issue a pretty standard disclaimer that the views I will express will be my own and not necessarily those of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas or the uh, Federal Reserve System. So um, last year, I think the last live speech I gave in 2020 was to the Austin, an Austin financial planners group. And the uh, opening slide from that presentation is more or less as you see it here. The, fo the, the focus of the presentation was very much on the fundamental drivers of long run prosperity, uh, as opposed to sort of the near term outlook. Uh, and that's kind of, I'm gonna talk about that stuff again today. But th those are things like demographics, productivity, growth, and trade. Um, and we dig, I will dig a little bit more into each of those topics as we go through this morning's presentation. As of the very beginning of last year, um, the, the global outlook still looked like the global economy would expand in 2020 um, uh, and 2021. Um, so uh, we were expecting 
global growth of about three and a half percent in both years. And then of course we got to March and everything suddenly went into rapid reverse. Um, the risks I was worried about at the beginning of 2020 were things like debt. That's still a risk. Uh, in fact, if anything, it's become a bigger risk. China, uh, the issue there had to do with the um, a legacy of the uh, global financial crisis in China and how China sustained economic activity. We were very worried about Brexit. Well, Brexit has now happened and it's gone maybe more smoothly than people thought. Uh, we were concerned about the trade wars that were going on. And then we always, I always include a sort of generic black swan type of risk. And that's sort of the catch all for all the things you don't know that you don't know are gonna happen. And of course the SARS COVID shock was the mother of all black swans. So the, um, sorry, what's happened here? So this shock that we've dealt with over the past year, it, it really is, well, hopefully, a once in a century health shock. Um, the last time we had a pandemic on this scale was literally about a hundred years ago when we had the Spanish flu pandemic that I think killed um, about 50 million people. Uh, we're nowhere near that level of mortality this time around because of better healthcare vaccines and things like that. Um, we're all familiar with the story. Uh, COVID spread rapidly from China to the rest of the world. The first incidents or reported cases were in Wuhan. I guess there's some debate about exactly how uh, early it emerged in China um, and some controversy about the nature of the transmission from bats to other animals to humans and so on. That's still being debated. But by the end of January, there were sufficient cases around the world for the WHO to declare a pandemic. At the, at the end of January. And what governments do in response to the spread of the disease, they impose massive stringent social distancing policies, shelter in place, stay at home, lockdown, quarantines, that basically caused economic activity to grind to a halt, first in China um, and then in the rest of the world. We saw an unprecedented collapse in economic activity. Um, and what this huge economic collapse prompted was a massive policy response, both fiscal and monetary, and I'll talk a bit about that um, later on. As hospitalizations have sort of grown and you know, risen and fallen, and so we've seen these waves of openings and closings and openings and closings. Um, the disease really seems to have gone in multiple waves. Um, and in the United States, we're currently out of an inflection point. We've had a big decline since uh, January, uh, but Europe, we're still seeing increased cases and increased lockdowns. So we're still far from being fully out of this episode. How did this affect the United States? I mean, we'll kind of bring it all home here. The initial concerns when this all started happening in China was that uh, this would primarily create supply chain disruptions. We didn't Get a, have a full appreciation that the disease would get to the United States and then spread as rapidly as it did. Um, when it did get here, we um, had mandated and voluntary reductions in mobility and engagement. Not all of the pullback from economic activity was mandated by the government. In many cases, as people learned about the severity of this disease, they chose to just scale back their interaction with their neighbors uh, workers and so on uh, of their own accord. Uh, obviously the sectors that were hit hardest were those where there's a high degree of social contact. So travel, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, bars, elective med med medical care and so on. Um, we learned a lot, I think, about how to deal with this uh, pandemic as we went through it. So we had a, an initial spring surge, uh, which was pretty bad, a midsummer surge, which was less devastating, but still pretty bad. And then of course, the, the fall and winter surge, which was truly catastrophic from a case hospitalization and deaths perspective. So let's just look at some of the international data on how this thing um, evolved. So this is just, uh, this is where it all began in China. Uh, you see that the cases, this is on a scale to, on a per million basis, cases per million. You see that in China, cases per million people peaked at just over three in, uh, at the end of January. And then what happened there is China shut down their economy. They 
locked things down on a scale that was simply impossible to do in any other country. You see there's these other mini little peaks in August and again in February of this year, this year, but pretty small compared to what was going on there in the spring. Here's how things looked in the um, more advanced economies. One thing you should note here is the scale, right? The peak there is three cases per million in China. That was the worst things ever got in China. The peak in the United States, United Kingdom was 800 cases per million. This disease was, has been far more devastating um, to the Western democracies than it ever was in China in terms of cumulative cases, deaths, hospitalizations or anything. But you see there again, the same pattern, this initial spring um, surge that prompted the initial lockdowns, things were getting better. Um, getting better uh, in Europe, except the United States where we still had high numbers of cases, close to 200 cases per million over the course of the summer, uh, some decline, and then the big fall surge, uh, which was particularly bad in the United Kingdom. And then you see the United Kingdom cases have come down dramatically. Among the, um, the um, advanced de developed countries, it's about the only one that's making real, real progress against this disease, in part because they have well, they had pretty draconian lockdowns, but they've also been much better at getting vaccines out to their population than almost any other country. And I'll show you some data on that in a minute. Um, here's the data for the big emerging market countries we track. Uh, again, you can see the cases per million for China. It just runs along the horizontal axis. It just barely registers. Again, given the draconian measures they put in place to keep people locked in their houses. But you see here the surges in places like Mexico, South Africa, and the current extremely high number of cases in Brazil, even though they're coming down, there are variants of the disease that are posing real challenges uh, to public health there. This is a very nice picture from uh, the Financial Times that just shows you the evolution of deaths from this disease from when we first started measuring it back in uh, March of last year. You see that um, in the European Union, there were a lot of deaths initially. Um, then the United States was pretty important, but then you see these things kind of going in and out like an accordion, other areas becoming important like Brazil, Latin America, Mexico over the course of the summer. You see then the late surge in the European Union, the UK, and of course the United States in terms of deaths, and then it's sort of coming in again, but it's, it's clear that deaths are again um, increasing at a global level. This thing is, is far from being under control. The reason I start with this is that in, in terms of what's driven economic activity last year and this year, it's this pandemic. I mean, no, we don't have to worry about trying to figure out what's causing the economy to expand or contract. It's all being driven by this virus, our response to the virus, our ability to contain it, our ability to reopen the economy as people get vaccinated or acquire immunity by other means. So here's a picture of global GDP growth um, going back to 1980. So you'll see that in 2020, uh, global GDP contracted by about 3.3%. That was far, a far greater decline in global G GDP growth than we saw uh, during the global financial crisis. If you see there in 2009, you see that growth basically dropped to about zero, but it did not go into negative territory in any meaningful sense. This uh, pandemic has been way, way more devastating to the global economy than even the global financial crisis was. When the IMF uh, put out their uh, annual forecast in 2020, they noted that there was a higher than usual degree of uncertainty around their forecast. They were projecting uh, growth to contract in 2020 and to expand, the economy to expand in 2021. So their most recent forecast was released in April of this, uh, just uh, last week, I think, or this week. They estimate that global GDP contracted 3.3% last year and will probably grow about 6% this year. But the recoveries are going to be very different. Not all countries are going to recover, recover equally fast, mainly because not all countries are getting vaccines out fast enough to their people, um, which is really a key part of being able to normalize economic activity. 
So again, 2020 was a year unlike any other. We had the first truly global pandemic since the Spanish flu of 1918, 1920. We had unprecedented drops in economic activity, followed by unprecedented rebounds. Monetary and fiscal policy actions were taken to smooth the shock, and these actions were taken on a massive scale. And then most uh, amazingly or encouragingly for all the bad news we've had over the past year, we've had the development of vaccines at an unprecedented pace. We've never had vaccines developed so quickly in response to a public health crisis. Now that in turn has given people some pause about taking these vaccines, but every epidemiologist or infectious disease expert I've talked to said they are all safe and good and equally effective at keeping you from dying or going into the hospital. So, so talk briefly about the fiscal policy response. Um, because this is gonna have implications for the longer term stuff. Um, as of last year, the global fiscal policy response was equivalent to about 8% of global GDP. Um, Japan, the Euro area and the United States collectively accounted for almost two thirds of all the stimulus that was put in place uh, last year. And then of course, we added another close to $2 trillion in stimulus at the beginning of this year to really try to move things along. Uh, the poorer, the less developed emerging market economies have had and have less capacity to engage in these kinds of big spending programs because they have less fiscal space. Uh, we can talk about that later if you're interested. Um, the way these fiscal actions were taken varied across countries, but about one third uh, of the fiscal actions took the form of direct cash payments to people like unemployment insurance and tax relief. And then about 20% was devoted to various job retention schemes. What did we at the Fed do uh, and other central banks? Um, interest rates were cut pretty quickly. Once it became clear in March um, that this was gonna be a big, big shock, the, the FOMC, which is the main policy making body at the Fed, cut interest rates back down to the effective lower bound. Um, so that was a rapid action, but the amount of the cut was smaller than was the case back in 2008, 2009, because we were starting from a pretty low level. We restarted the various asset purchase programs that we um, had created in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And this was mainly, these were mainly actions taken in the advanced economies. But then we also put in place uh, various other um, uh, programs to try to get money out to businesses that were uh, in trouble in the form of direct monetary financing, funding for lending schemes, credit market backstops, and things like that. So now let's just transition over to the, um, the, um, the, the broader picture. So when I do a, my, my, my typical stump speech, if you will, I try to avoid getting too bogged down in the um, nitty gritty of what's gonna happen over the next month or quarter or year, and try to draw people's attention to the more fundamental secular forces that are driving um, how things are gonna evolve over the next five to 10 years. And these are typically demographics, productivity growth, globalization, and debt. So on the demographic, demographic side, most of you I'm sure know by now that we have aging populations in many, many countries around the world and shrinking populations in some. The most um, prominent example of a rich developed country with a shrinking population is of course, Japan. But even in China, uh, while the, popu the overall population is not shrinking, the working age population is shrinking. Uh, it's part of the legacy of um, the one child policy. Um, the COVID shock kind of interacted with this phenomenon of an aging population because it really impacted older people way more severely than did the Spanish flu. The mortality rate associated with the Spanish flu is almost the exact opposite of the mortality rate associated with this, whereas with the Spanish flu is mainly young working age people who are dying. The COVID-19 uh, shock has mainly affected the elderly and people with comorbidities. Along with demographics, the other thing that's most important for uh, rising living standards over time is productivity growth. It's really the single most important determinant of improvements in living standards over time. And we often frame this at the Dallas Fed as using the language of technology enabled disruption. And we saw massive examples of this over the past year. Uh, many people were able to shift 
almost pretty seamlessly to working in offices to working from home. Now, not everybody could do this, but a surprising chunk of uh, the labor force, both in the United States and around the world, uh, were able to shift from going to the office every day to working out of their dining room. Huge surge in online retailing, okay? Big, so big changes to the way we live our everyday lives. The big open-ended question here is going to be how many of these changes will persist when things are normalized later this year or early next year. One observation on the shift to work from home, um, and this is something we could maybe come back to in the Q&A or whatever. If it's possible for you to do your, your work anywhere, then it is possible for someone anywhere to do your work. I'll just let you think about that for a minute in terms of what it means for wage growth going forward. Globalization has been, in my opinion, an unalloyed boon for um, living standards, both domestically and um, around the world. It's driven, it was driven by big policy changes and innovations in technology. The invention of the container ship was just a huge, huge stimulus to global trade. Um, lower tariffs on traded goods um, uh, made it possible for lower income people here to access cheaper uh, necessities sourced from India and China. Globalization also means that more economic activity now takes place in the so-called emerging market economies than in the advanced economies. Uh, I'll show you a, a picture on that. But globalization also meant that this virus was able to spread very quickly on global trade and travel networks. Um, so that's sort of the downside of globalization. And it also highlighted, I think, uh, vulnerabilities associated with extended uh, supply chains. And then debt. And debt we can view either as a, a secular trend or a risk. But there's no question that the ability of governments in rich countries to borrow large amounts of money to help smooth this shock made things a lot easier than they would otherwise have been absent, that ability to borrow. The problem is all that borrowing is gonna to have to be repaid at some point down the road. So let me just dig into the demographic and go through some of this stuff fairly quickly, the demographic stuff. So again, we've aging populations in almost all advanced economies, declining working age population in some and declining total population in some. So I mentioned China and Japan as regards both of those first two points is this is going to put enormous strain on the public finances over and above all the pressures that's going to come from all this debt we've accumulated because we've promised ourselves great benefits for when we retire and there's going to be fewer people around when we all retire to pay those benefits so that is going to create some challenges for uh, governments in terms of how they manage and deliver on the promises that have been made. It has implications for innovation and productivity growth and also for the so-called natural rate of interest which is kind of an esoteric concept, but it's basically tells us what's the normal level of interest rates that we should expect to see in the United States when we were past a crisis. So prior to the global financial crisis, we thought the normal level of the short-term interest rates was about four, four and a half percent. Now we think it may be closer to two or two and a half percent because of the slowing of the uh, growth of the population and the slower productivity growth. But this just shows you the um, projections from the um, United Nations over the next century of which age groups are going to go grow most rapidly. And the red line there is the uh, 65 plus age group. And you can see that's going to be the most rapid that has been since the 1960s and will continue to be the most rapidly growing component of the global population uh, for the next century. Um, relatively fewer um, people aged zero to 14 by the end of the century. In fact, um, we expect um, people aged zero to 14 will actually be decline, declining, contributing negative, negatively to population growth. Here's another way to look at these trends. Um, this is just looking at the working age population as a share of the world total. The share of workers in the global population peaked in 2014 and has been declining since then. It is likely to continue to decline through the middle of the century and probably through the end of the century. But you see that big uptrend from the uh, 1960s through 2010, 2015. That was a huge tailwind to global prosperity. Having all these people coming into the workforce who can be productive members of the 
labor force contribute to GDP and economic growth, that, that tailwind is now converting into a headwind. Yet another way to think about this is since about 2017, there are more people over 65 than there are under the age of five in the world. So a pretty striking crossing of those two lines. And again, driven by a variety of different, I mean, demographics reflected a lot of different things, changes in living standard, changes in life expectancy, changes in fertility rates, and so on. But you see that there's, there's expected to be way, way more people over the age of 65 than uh, under the age of five going forward. What's interesting if you dig into these numbers is that um, there are certain regions of the world where this is not the case. And the one region where demographics are actually quite favorable is Africa. And I'm showing you this picture to hopefully you can see Africa is huge. And you also see it's very dark at night, which means it's actually poor. Right? They don't have lighting. There's not a lot of economic activity going on in Africa, but there's lots and lots of people in Africa. And you see just to the north of Africa, there is this brightly lit Western Europe. So there's this desperate need for workers in Western Europe, which is experiencing aging and declining populations in certain places, and a desperate need for employment in Africa. And that's contributing to this sort of migration crisis that uh, has gone in and out of the news. Um, depending on what other stories we're dealing with um, um, uh, at the time. But th th this migration issue was very much a key part of the whole debate about Brexit and the need to control borders. Um, and I mean, again, we have some of these debates in our own country as well about how we should deal with the southern border. But you know, I I'm just mentioning this because these demographic forces are a non-trivial contributor to these migration pressures all around the world. So how does demography contribute to um, economic activity? Well, the productive capacity of a country really depends on three things. The population, the amount of capital these people, the population has to work with, both physical and intangible, and the state of technology. And the contribution of the population in turn depends on, well, how big is the population of working age? Uh, how many of those people of working age participate? And then when you do participate, how many hours do you work? So this just shows you some of the trends in participation rates for prime age workers in the G7. The G7 is just a group of countries, the wealthiest um, um, Western democracies. So the US, Germany, Canada, Italy, Japan, UK, and France. And you see this upward trend in, um, participation rates over time um, for pretty much all of these countries. Although what you do see is that that big upward trend in the United States kind of leveled off um, um, in the 1990s. A lot of that pickup in the US was largely due to the entry of women into the labor force, but it's no longer increasing. Whereas in other Western countries, participation is continuing to rise. And prime age workers are those aged between 25 and 54. The only country with a lower participation rate than the United States is um, Italy. The other thing you can note on this chart is at the very end there, there's a dip. You see that tick down in all of the series. That's the decline in the participation rate due to the COVID pandemic. Um, the COVID pandemic disproportionately affected the ability of women in all countries to participate in market activity because uh, ultimately the burden of childcare fell on them when schools closed down. So uh, an important open question is how much of that um, decline will be reversed as things normalize. This is just showing you um, the details for males um, in the United States versus other countries and how extraordinary the decline in the participation rate for prime age males has been. It used to be 98% of all men between the ages of 25 and 54 participated in some kind of economic activity. That's now declined to about uh, 88%. And again, the only country with a poorer participation rate for prime age males is Italy. Um, and again, that's kind of problematic when you have 10% of uh, able-bodied men not participating in the labor market. Uh, I mentioned the gains by, I mean, the earlier chart showed uh, the overall, we just looked at males. Here's the chart for females. So you see the stalling out in the participation rate for US females. Among other rich countries, prime age women participate on a far higher rate in economic activity than do prime age women in the United States. Again, the only country where uh, 
rich country where participation rates are lower is Italy. The only good sign is that when Americans do participate, they tend to work a lot of hours. So um, it helps offset some of those lower participation rates. Um, but the trends in hours worked have been declining over time. But the United States is now among rich countries. We put in more hours than our counterparts in any other country. So that's the demographic stuff. So here's the productivity problem. So this is a, a picture of productivity growth in the United States over the past uh, 60 years, going back to 1948. And the immediate post-World War II period, there was a really rapid growth in productivity in the US. And that really contributed to the boom in living standards in the, the 25 years after World War II from basically the late 1940s through 1973. So you see average productivity growth was about 2.1%. Then something happened in 1973 that caused productivity growth to slow down to uh, about a quarter of that rate, to about 0.6%. And that productivity slowdown lasted until 1995. And then in, something happened in 1995. Well, what happened in 1995 was the invention of the internet and Netscape and all of these internet related um, applications, the ability to link computers together to make people more productive. And we saw another surge in productivity growth uh, from 95 through the global financial crisis in 2007, not quite to the levels of the post-World War II period, but certainly to levels that made us all feel a lot uh, better off for quite some time. But then after the global financial crisis, productivity growth slowed down again and has been pretty slow since. This is not just a US phenomenon. I mean, this has happened all across the OECD. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, you see that from 1985 through 2007, average productivity growth among this group. This is basically the 30 richest democracies in the world. Um, productivity was growing about 1% a year. And since um, 2007, it's just collapsed to close to 0% a year. Now these slow, these weak productivity numbers are kind of surprising when you read stories like this in uh, the Financial Times uh, about workplace automation and how artificial intelligence is going to render large numbers of white collar workers uh, redundant. You know, previous waves of, uh, of automation have primarily affected um, uh, blue collar workers, whereas the current wave of innovation seems to be more consequential for white collar workers. But then on the other hand, um, you know, I've been hearing about self-driving cars for a long time and they're still a, seem to be a bit ways off. Um, you know, I mean, they're coming at some pace, but there, there seem to be very substantive obstacle, obstacles to people's willingness to get into a vehicle that doesn't have an actual driver. We uh, organize conference every um, year now. We have another version of it coming up in May on technology enabled disruption. And we bring in business leaders and so on to talk about um, how they perceive these new technologies being employed in their lines of business. And I have two quotes there. I'm not going to read them. One is from Craig Boyne at HEB uh, speaking about the potential for autonomous vehicles uh, more likely to be in the last mile than having a 18 wheeler flying down I-35 without a driver. In, um, Craig Hall has an office park up in Frisco and they did a big trial with autonomous vehicles um, in their office park. And the thinking was that in a closed environment, uh, people might be more willing to get into one of these things because you know you're just going from office building to office building or office building to restaurant. You're not gonna be going out on a freeway or areas where traffic is um, dangerous. And even in a closed environment, it proved very hard for, um, to persuade people to get into these vehicles without uh, actual human drivers. So there's still some, you know, for all the hype we hear about a lot of uh, stuff, uh, new technologies, there are still enormous psychological barriers to be overcome. This is just showing you, I mean, you all are familiar with pictures like this. So I'll skip over this pretty quickly. I mean, we all know that technology is, is rocketing ahead driven by basic physics, you know, the speed of internet connection speeds, um, disk drive prices, the ability to cram more stuff onto storage, transistor price, all these things are just getting phenomenally cheaper at a, at a phenomenal rate. Businesses are spending um, way, way more of their um, 
equipment spending is going on uh, IT equipment as opposed to uh, non-IT related stuff. It's about a third of all investment spending now goes to some form of information technology related equipment. So what we think when we talk about technology enabled disruption in Dallas, we have sort of a working definition. We think it encompasses the things like workers being displaced by technology, business models being supplanted by new models, which are often technology enabled, consumers being able to use technology to ship, shop for goods and services at lower prices and greater convenience. I mean, think of what just happened over the past year, and that in turn then has implications for the pricing power of businesses. Um, when businesses lose their pricing power, that means they intensify their focus on creating greater efficiencies. And we think these combined forces are actually becoming a much greater factor in the economic outcomes of workers. Now, if you go and ask um, Americans, does automation help or hurt? Um, it, there's a lot of variation across age groups. Uh, the, the, the percentage of Americans who think that workplace automation has hurt them uh, is highest among those aged 50. Um, you see that younger people are less um, concerned about um, the impact of automation. But then it, it, when you think about that, it's probably makes sense in that older workers tend to have skills that are more difficult to adopt to newer technologies. Is automation, uh, do you think that uh, that robots and computers will do the following work in the next, the work done by other humans or the work type of work I do. So <laughs> the funny thing here is that most people think that automation is gonna affect other people's jobs, but not theirs. So there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect there that those two things can't be uh, true. Um, so people, some people are gonna likely be surprised by how disruptive innovation is. What kind of jobs are most likely to be disrupted? A uh, fast food worker, very likely to be disrupted. Nurse, not at all likely to be disrupted. And then a lot of variation in between. Um, there was a, uh, a good study done about oh, close to 10 years ago now by a couple of academics in Oxford that calculated that about all, close to half of all US employment is at risk of being disrupted uh, due to automation. And they went literally went occupation by occupation. So things like telemarketers, title examiners, mathematical technicians, insurance underwriters are most susceptible to disruption, computerization. The kind of occupations that are least computerizable are things like recreational therapists, um, emergency management directors, mental health and substance abuse social workers, and audiologists. Uh, e economists are kind of in the middle. There's about a 43% chance that people like me will be replaced by a computer in a couple of years time. So. You know, the interesting thing though, and you know, I, I like to remind people of this, this is why I think it's important to take a historical view on some of these issues is that um, concerns about machines displacing workers are not new. Uh, these go back to the earliest days of economics as a science. David Ricardo was one of the first greats of economics and he wrote about this issue, quote, substitution of machinery for human labor is often very injurious to the interests of the class of laborers. It may render the population redundant and deteriorate the condition of the labor. If machinery could do all the work that labor now does, there would be no demand for labor and nobody would be entitled to consume anything who is not a capitalist and who could not buy a machine. I mean, I think if you listen to quotes like that, you, you can surely hear echoes of them in some of the concerns that are being expressed about how automation may disrupt employment going forward. And interestingly, the word robot was introduced into um, the English language in 1921 by a Czech playwright, uh, Karol Čapek, uh, who wrote this play called uh, Rossum's Universal Robots. That's where the word robot comes from. And uh, he wrote about these machines that think and act like humans and they eventually rebel leading to the extinction of the human race. And any of you who have seen the Terminator movies may see some echoes of those kinds of concerns again. 1920s, New York Times, the march of the machine makes idle hands. The Great Depression, Albert Einstein, the most famous intellectual of his age. It cannot be doubted that severe economic depression is to be traced back for the most part to the improvement in the apparatus of production through technical invention, which and organization which has decreased the need for human labor, thereby caused a progressive decrease in the purchasing power of consumers. 
And if you actually look at the frequency with which concerns about technological unemployment are uh, appear in the Google text corpora, they were greatest during the uh, Great Depression. We now actually know that um, uh, the Great Depression was not caused by technological change. It was caused by mistakes of fiscal and monetary policy. But the point being, again, that these fears about technology displacing jobs have been around for a long time. Even Kurt Vonnegut wrote about this uh, in one of his first novels. Um, but there's, a, when you look at the data, um, there are grounds to be a little bit more optimistic. So one great example is the introduction of the auto automated teller machine in banks. The ATM was first introduced in the 1970s and the number of ATMs in the United States increased from about 100,000 to about 400,000 uh, between 1995 and 2010. What happened over the same period was that bank teller employment increased from half a million to 550,000 between 1980 and 2010. So ATMs were explicitly designed to um, replace bank tellers in certain key functions that they provide. But instead, what AT operate a branch, so banks opened more branches, so they needed more tellers to operate those branches. So tellers spent less time doing the routine cash handling and more time on things like relationship banking. And if you look at uh, like very, very high level data, I'll skip, I'll go through this pretty quickly. You look at um, the amount of capital we have per worker in the United States going back to 1950. That's an orange line. We now have way, way, way more capital, machinery, computers per person in the United States than was the case back in 1950. But you don't see any trend in the unemployment rate. As we've made more and more capital available for each worker, the unemployment rate has gone up. That's the blue line, goes up and down, up and down, up and down. They're the business cycle. But you don't see any upward trend associated with uh, greater automation. Uh, if anything, the, num the share of the population employed seems to have increased as we've brought more capital online uh, to, to be available to workers. And the same thing is true is if you just look at the number of ideas out there, productivity, how we combine capital and labor. You know, we've, we've gotten smarter at using workers and machines to make stuff, even with even a five-fold increase in our technological know-how is not associated with any significant upward trend in unemployment. So the bottom line here is though, it's hard to make predictions, you know, these white collar job apocalypses, uh, you know, have yet to come about. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna skip over this, these parts. Um, how do we deal with this stuff? Um, so, I mean, this, the, the, you know, having been sort of given the, you know, sunny interpretation of technological change, it is real. And, and like trade, people do lose their jobs to um, new technologies. So the key kind of policy responses is you wanna have a flexible workforce. You wanna have institutions in place to uh, facilitate the training and retraining of people who may have to transition out of one sector and into another sector. It raises a question um, about whether the educational models we have in place are really appropriate for a virtual economy. Some have proposed putting a tax on robots um, one question is whether a tax on robots will be any different from a regular tax on capital. There's a proposals, there have been many proposals for universal basic income. Uh, at least one presidential ca uh, candidate last year, or not presidential candidate, somebody in the primaries was proposing universal basic income. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's gaining popularity, uh, both in the US and other countries often for reasons that are not immediately related to technological change. One of the problems with the universal basic income is that it would be extraordinarily expensive compared to existing welfare programs. So it's not clear that um, it was the most, it's the most efficient uh, way to go. Some of the research we've had presented at our conferences suggests that if you try to compare retraining robot taxes and universal basic income that better retraining, better community colleges really offer the best return in dealing with this problem. So that's just a summary, I'll skip over that. Um, I like these cartoons, I like to include them. So people who've been immune to digital transformation, I think 
learned a lot over the past year about the need to maybe rethink uh, how well their current business models are working. So quickly on globalization, pivotal event in the history of globalization was um, the decline, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And then immediately after that, you see this huge boom in global trade as measured by the share of exports of goods and services in global economic activity, you know, went up from 20% to close to 32% or so. A big dip after the um, um, uh, global financial crisis, a rebound and, you don't see the same growth over the past two years or a decade, two decades, as we saw in the run up to the global financial crisis. We know that um, there's more discontent with globalization that, as manifested in electoral outcomes in the United Kingdom, France, the United States over the past five, 10 years. People are a little bit more concerned about open borders. Uh, in part because I think Western democracies have done a very poor job at facilitating the movement of people from declining sectors into emerging sectors. Um, support for openness, I think, is more fragile than it has been in a long time. And I think, uh, you know, we, we had this um, trade conflict with um, China uh, under the President Trump's administration where um, he uh, raised tariffs on uh, um, Chinese goods, uh, basically because of a perceived inequity in the US-China trade relationship, having to do with theft of intellectual property and things like that. Um, there is a phase one agreement that's been put in place that is hopefully going to lead to a more normalization of um, relations and the lowering of tariffs eventually, although I guess the current Biden administration has not expressed any great need to rush to get those uh, tariffs removed. Um, but it did affect a big chunk of China trade. Um, so, uh, and that did raise the cost of certain goods for US consumers. There's no question about that. Uh, I think this incident in the Suez Canal um, um, a week or two ago <laughs> was a very neat reminder of just how fragile the global trading system is. Even if policy works perfectly, uh, it's still susceptible to disruptions. There's certain choke points that can be very quickly become actual choke points uh, when things do not go as well as they're supposed to go. Okay, so that's all kind of background and so on. Where are we now? So this, the way we look at the global economy, our quickest read on the state of the global economy are these purchasing managers indexes. So we've plotted them here for the United States and um, the world, uh, US in black, the world in blue. The shaded area on the left of the chart is the great, the, the global financial crisis. See the big, big dip in the PMI for the United States back then associated with a huge recession. And then you move over to the right of the chart, you see a big dip in the United States, a very sharp drop and then a very sharp recovery, both in the United States and globally. And a, as you get into 2021, uh, even sharper recovery. What's behind all of this is of course, what's going on with cases and um, deaths. So here's a, so one of the things we've learned over the past year is forecasting the course of this disease is extraordinarily difficult. None of the models and the models are extremely sophisticated, do a very, very good job at forecasting. What we tend to look at is a, an ensemble forecast, an average of a whole bunch of forecasts to try to get a sense of where things are going over at least the next four weeks. That's about as far ahead as you can confidently predict. But you see here the case again, going back to the beginning of last year, low cases, the spring surge decline, the summer surge decline, the big, big winter surge and the falling off and we were making great progress um, as the vaccines were rolled out and so on, but things have kind of leveled off. Um, right now, we're basically in a race between uh, vaccines and variants of this virus, uh, and that will really determine the course of the economy. Deaths, are, are, they've come down, but are still projected to, 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 to stay at fairly high levels, uh, comparable to where we were at the beginning of last summer. This just shows you where we stand in terms of vaccination rates. Uh, again, I'm just showing you here the, uh, the, the five big industrialized countries that we typically track. The United Kingdom has basically vaccinated or gotten at least one shot of some kind of vaccine into about half of their population. 
Um, that's again why the cases there have come down so fast. We we started off slow in the United States, where we're making real, real good progress. It's close to a third of the population have at least one shot now. Um, Canada and European Union are lagging behind, and Japan is way, way behind. The only countries that are doing better, actually, I'm sure you guys know this, are Israel. It's like off that chart. I mean, they've done even better. And I think the UAE have been extraordinarily successful at getting the vaccines out to their people. The problem is this this um, this uh, virus does not respect political borders. Um, and we need to be concerned about the pace of vaccination in other countries. And if you look at sort of the big emerging market countries like Brazil, Mexico, India, South Africa, and so on, the numbers there are nowhere near as high as they should be uh, if we're to get this whole thing under control uh, globally. And, and, and it has to be done at the global level for things to fully normalize. So there's still a lot of work to be done there. China actually is also being somewhat far behind the game in terms of getting vaccines out. So even though they were able to keep their cases low through social distancing measures, they have not been as effective at getting vaccines out. In fact, it's hard to get good vaccination data for China. So how does the Fed think about the outlook? So um, in March, the committee put out, the Federal Open Market Committee put out, put out a revised summary of economic projections. We, they think that uh, US GDP is gonna grow about six and a half percent this year, slowing to 3.3% 3 3 next year and 2.2% year after that. That's all above trend growth. That's gonna close the current output gap. Long run potential growth in the United States is about 1.8%. Unemployment should end this year about four and a half percent, which is pretty darn low, and then fall even further next year and the year after to about 3.5 percent, which is effectively where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. Inflation is going to overshoot our two percent target this year to about two and a half percent, but then moderate to close to the two percent target um, over the next two years. And interest rates will be kept close to zero over that forecast horizon. If you look at you know, forecast for the rest of the world, pretty much every country is expected to grow. Here's just the, you know, high level aggregates for the world, the advanced economies and the uh, emerging market economies, you see growth both this year and next year. You break it down by individual countries, you see that every country under 2020, every rich country experienced a contraction in GDP in 2020. They're all expected to recover and grow at varying rates this year and next. Same thing with um, the big emerging market economies. The one exception here I draw your attention to is China in 2021. It was the only big country that did not contract uh, in, in 2020, in part because of the speed uh, and draconian nature of their lockdown early in the year meant that they could reopen much faster than any other country. What are the risks? Well. The risks are like the ones we talked about pre-COVID, debt, China, Europe, trade, black swans. Um, they're probably not as important uh, as they were two years ago. Post-COVID, we're in a race between virus variants and vaccines. Um, it is, I mean, the, the more this virus spreads, the more it mutates and the greater the possibility of a mutation that would be resistant to the vaccines. That has not happened yet, but this is why vaccination not just in the United States, but globally is so important. Debt still matters uh, despite, despite what people say. And we've got way, way more of it than we had two years ago. China matters even more. One upside risk is we may have faster productivity growth going forward. We may see something of a return to the roaring twenties because this COVID shock has prompted the adoption of a lot of new technologies that otherwise we would have just left dormant. But let me just show you some pictures on the debt situation. This is just comparing the US situation and Germany's. And you see that you know both the United States and Germany ran up a lot of debt in response to the global financial crisis in 2007, 2009. But unlike Germany, we kept accumulating debt over the subsequent decade, whereas Germany began to run down its debt through the COVID crisis. And then both countries, again, a big bump up in their debt associated with um, the COVID crisis. If you look at the outlook for deficits for the United States, we ran a record peacetime deficit last year. And by the looks of things, according to CBO estimates, uh, these deficits are not gonna go away anytime soon. 
And in fact, the um, interest payment on our outstanding debt is going to consume, be responsible for a bigger portion of the deficit. And if you want to see this in a truly, truly historical context, this goes all the way back to um, 1790, the founding of the Republic. So 230 years. So it's just the federal debt held by the public relative to economic activity since 1790. We're now at levels of debt associated with what we had after World War II, and we're on a trajectory to go well, well past that. At some point, that is going to prove challenging to deal with. When exactly, it's hard to say, but um, it, it is a, a, a genuine concern. Uh, but just to show you, this where we are and where we're headed is completely unprecedented in the history of the American Republic. I talked about how the world has changed due to globalization. This is just showing you the share of economic activity that takes place in the uh, rich world versus the emerging countries. Uh, in about tw 2007, economic activity was about equally distributed between the advanced economies and the emerging market economies. Since 2007, the emerging market economies have accounted for more economic activity than the advanced economies, and those two lines are just diverging further. <clears throat> the US and China, again, it's very hard to measure, compare the sizes of uh, two economies that use two different currencies and are at different stages of development, but by most estimates, by some estimates, China is already the world's biggest economy. And even if it's not today, it will be sometime within the next decade. Um, and it's, it's hard to see that trend reversing anytime soon. In some ways, it's a, a kind of reversion to the way the world was prior to the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> Back in 18, um, in, 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 uh, prior to the, this chart doesn't actually go back far enough. Um, but you go back to 1820 or pre-industrial revolution, China was much bigger than any Western country. And what's happening now is that the sort of its, its sheer physical size and weight demographically is beginning to reassert itself in the global economy. The reason this kind of matters is that if things go wrong in China, well, you know, 20 years ago, a shock, a decline in Chinese GDP growth had an imperceptible effect on US GDP growth. And that's what this chart is showing is you, the red line is the decline in Chinese GDP growth and the black line is what would happen to the US and it's insignificantly different from zero. But you fast forward to today, um, now a slowdown, a crisis, a problem in China would have a measurable effect on the US economy. So it's not something we can ignore anymore. Um, I have some slides in here about uh, other issues related to Brexit, but this has basically become a non-issue, so I'm not going to spend any time talking about them. You see the, you know, the effects of the Brexit referendum on investment in the United Kingdom, but that, of course, was dwarfed by what COVID did to investment in the United Kingdom, so uh, I don't think I'll talk about that. Um, investment, again, declined a lot across the, there was a big decline in investment in the rich countries associated with the global financial crisis and another big decline, but much quicker recovery from the COVID crisis. So <clears throat> I will just get to my conclusion slide. Again, I, I think when you're trying to think about the world and um, where we're headed, it's uh, important to always have the, um, the, the secular background in mind, what's going on with things like demographics, productivity, uh, <clears throat> trade and so on. <clears throat> I should have, up actually, I didn't update this slide, sorry. Um, but, but based on what we've been through and under optimistic scenarios for vaccination and so on, most forecasters are expecting that we'll see pretty robust growth globally this year and next year. So that should be 2021 and 2022. And the US is likely to be one of the better performers uh, going forward. All these issues, you know, the debt, China stuff, Brexit and Italy are less of an issue going forward. The black swans are always there. Given that we've just had to deal with a black swan, hopefully it'll be a while before another one uh, makes an appearance. But I mean, the last thing I would leave you with was that point about the possibility of a surge in productivity growth, that we get something like the Roaring Twenties. Again, if you go back, to, I'm, I'm, I think that that's a reference to the 1920s, where <clears throat> we had very, very rapid growth in, 
the US economy driven by a lot of innovations and technology, radio, television, the automobile and stuff like that. Maybe something like that is around the corner associated with artificial intelligence and so on. So I will kind of stop there. And if you have time for questions, um, I was told by my, my colleague in CNO to you know, let you know that we we constantly run these surveys and we're always looking for people to um, participate. So if you're interested in participating in one of these surveys, let us know. And I think you can just uh, scan this um, uh, QR code. It should take you to some kind of a survey or link that will allow you to either give feedback on this presentation and maybe sign up for the surveys as well. So I know I ran a bit long, but, but uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> Hey. So I happy to take questions or whatever. Thank you, Mark. Thank. You. So uh, one question we have that I'll answer is that uh, when we always get this is, will the slides be available? Uh, we uh, provided that sometimes uh, the presenters feel uh, treat them as proprietary and do not share them. But as long as the pre presenters um, want it, are open to sharing their slides, we will be posting them on our website uh, after the event. Um, so here's a question. Here's a question mark. Um, so workforce training programs policies often focus on getting people into tech jobs. The ATM example suggests that the substitute for jobs will likely be more customer oriented skills that bridge technologies and humans. If training is likely the most efficient and effective strategy, how do we know we are training people for the right jobs in the future? Is there are is there are there projections of the types of jobs that will come in as automation comes into different industries? Uh, there are, I don't have them uh, off the top of my head, but um, the thing with automation is people need to fix the machines. There's always a need for maintenance staff. People need to maintain and fix. So there's a huge demand for engineers. Uh, computer technicians at various different levels designing the le next type of machine. So obviously the skill levels required to be designing chips versus, you know, uh, troubleshooting the basic computer problems we all have. I mean, there's, there's, but more automation does create a whole bunch of new jobs for to support all that technology that's now out there. Um, it can be a bit difficult, I think, to predict. But so I've always thought that well, I made this comment earlier that one of the things we've learned over this pandemic is that if you can work from anywhere, somebody anywhere can do your jobs. And this is a much bigger threat to white collar work than I think people realize. You know, there was, you know, those, those of us of a certain age remember the first great wave of outsourcing. You know, first you take, you know, the accounting department out of the company and put it somewhere in Iowa. Then you take it from Iowa and send it to India. What we've learned over the past year is there's probably a lot more stuff could be sent to India or Argentina or Eastern Europe than we thought was the case. To the extent that we're content with these kinds of Zoom interactions, that's a whole separate issue is just how, what kind of productivity is lost. Personally, I think a lot is lost with these types of interactions and a lot happens in face-to-face -face meetings that you simply cannot replicate. So I'm, I'm relatively optimistic that we're gonna get closer back to the normal we had pre-crisis than many people think, but there's gonna be some part of what we've done over the past year that's gonna stick and stay permanent. Uh, but again, predicting exactly where the growth industries are going to be is a challenge. But old fashioned trades, plumbing, electrician, you know, the stuff that's not glamorous yet, anybody who lived through that storm two months ago <laughs> really appreciated having access to a good plumber you know, pretty quick. You know, the, and those those jobs will never go away. We're, we're not going to automate away water and plumbing and things like that. So there's always going to be a certain baseline. Nursing, I mean, as the this is this feeds in with the whole um, aging of the population thing. There's going to be huge demand for um, uh, gerontologists and nurses and medical uh, personnel who can deal with an older population. But the labor department does put out projections of where they think. Uh, the biggest, the fastest job growths are going to be. And I, I don't know how, ac I've never looked at, to see how accurate they are, uh, but those projections are out there. And I would, if you really want to get a more informed opinion than mine, um, I, would, I would check out the, labor, the BLS or the Labor Department's website. I mean, the other thing is training people to be flexible. 
that's what I've always thought. I mean, train, it's not so much the skill, it, it, it's the, the skill of analytical thinking, being able to think analytically and being able to communicate. Those kinds of skills, I think, are going to be way more valuable going forward than you know, whether you can program a specific language or speak a specific language. It's that, can you think analytically? Can you, can you adopt to new situations, new incentives? Can you communicate? In fact, those kinds of what are traditionally called soft skills, I think, are, are going to be important. Great. Um, another question, does the Dallas Fed have analysis of the pandemic's economic impact on household and small businesses by counties, MSAs, or zip codes? Oh, gosh. Um, we have a ton of stuff on the website. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we've something out published yet. I know we've done a lot of internal analysis. I just could not, but if you go to the um, Dallas Fed economics blog, you'll probably find very quick write-ups that we've done over the past year. And they, those blog posts will link to longer pieces if they're there. Um, I don't know how detailed they've gotten, whether they've gotten down to the MSA county level or not, uh, whether it's done by you know, income group and so on. But I, I know we have looked at a lot of stuff over the past year. Great, thank you. But again, yeah, you, you'll find all the stuff right on. Just go to DallasFed.org. Okay. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, oh, I had sorry. You, you you pretty much answered my one about your opinion on whether the work from home trend will stick. Um, anecdotally, my uh, commute down the freeway is almost returned to normal. So I don't know how much of a permanent uh, component that will be in in the in the work in the in the in the productivity model going forward. So that was, I, but I think you answered that adequately. Um, my other question is, um, what happened in the early 1970s that created the drop in productivity? If I could answer that question, I would get a Nobel Prize. It, it, it's a <laughs> well, big my, mystery. My that is, it was disco. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, it, it's actually still not very well understood. I mean, a lot of people think it was the oil shock, but when you sort of dig into it, it's not really clear that it was the oil shock. It's something of a mystery. It may well have what, what happened. So one story is that we had the Great Depression and World War II. There's a whole backlog of invention and ideas and innovations occurring during the 1930s and 1940s that just couldn't be put in place because of the depression and the war. So after the depression of the war, you had 20 years worth of new ideas and things to push out there, ways of doing business. And it took 20, 25 years to sort of exhaust that stock of ideas and then things kind of slow down to normal. Um, but it could also have been the growing burden of taxation, regulation, uh, and so on. It could also be that innovations tend to come, big innovations tend to come slowly. So a lot of the innovations associated with uh, the boom in the post-World War II period would have been associated with things as every day as the jet engine. I mean, the invention of the jet engine fundamentally changed international travel. The invention of the container changed international trade. Uh, all kinds of things we take for granted uh, now. Electrification, the completion of rural electrification, uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, and then these other innovations, so you, 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 you get electricity into everybody's house. That makes it possible for everybody to have a washing machine and a dishwasher. That frees up a lot of women's, what was traditionally women's time that was spent on domestic chores. Now women can participate in the labor force. You, you suddenly doubled the effective size of the labor force because you don't need so much labor spent doing domestic chores. Uh, once everything is electrified, um, then people buy computers. It's easy enough for everybody to have a computer at home. And then you put in a broadband network. And these technologies all kind of build on each other. And they, you know, there can maybe times when there's just a big surge. So it took a long while for electricity to have its full impact on our living standards and productivity because you have to build these huge networks. It's like with the electric cars now, right? The Tesla's the big hurdle to more people drive. Well, not deep, it's not deep, it's one of the hurdles is that people are scared they're going to get stuck out in the middle of West Texas with no charging station, right? <laughs> You know, we don't have a network of charging stations, but we're building them. I mean, <laughs> but there wasn't a, there wasn't always a network of gas stations either, right? You're not afraid to drive out to Marfa and run out of gas because you know there's going to be a gas station in Marfa, but 
there isn't there may not be a place to plug in your actually in Marfa there probably is a place to plug in your Tesla but but you might be yet the point is that a lot of these technologies may require other uh, things to be in place before they can have their full impact. I like with computers, we had computers around for a lot longer than they really, be, before they fully showed up in productivity growth. So like starting in the 1980s, we had PCs, but it was only in the 1990s when people figured out how do you link all these computers together? Then they really began to enhance our productivity. And it's like now with the computers, we all carry in our hands, you know, we're still, I don't know that we still fully figured out how to make us, how to have them make us more productive. I mean, they're great sources of entertainment, but can we use them now to enhance our productivity of actually making useful stuff as opposed to playing solitaire or Candy Crush or something like that? Not that there's anything wrong with Candy Crush, but. <laughs> Very good. Um, so uh, you touched on this, uh, but my question is around the debt associated with all the stimulus. Um, and there's a lot of discussion, the concern about inflation or the ability to repay. Um, what, what are the models, what are you forecasting on how that will get repaid over what period of time will it get repaid and what should we be concerned about going forward with that debt? So, so a couple of things. Um, if interest rates remain low, servicing the debt is not going to be challenging. If interest rates go up, it just means more tax revenue has to go to just servicing the debt, uh, regardless of whether you pay it off. You can just keep rolling it over, but you still have to service it. So if interest rates increase to where they were, say, 20 years ago, it just means more of our tax revenue goes to servicing the debt, which means there's less available to spend on social programs or whatever else you want to spend tax revenue on. So then you either have to cut back on those programs or you have to raise taxes. Those are the difficult choices you're going to be faced with. Um, the United States government always pays its debts. And that's why U.S. debt is always viewed as a safe uh, asset, the, the safest asset in the world. Um, and that means that there's a lot of foreign demand for our debt which makes it easier for us to borrow from, we can borrow from many, many countries who can borrow in our own currency. Now, if something were to happen to cause people to lose faith in the willingness of the United States to repay its debts, then that will be problematic, but that doesn't seem to be on the horizon. People talk about the Euro or the renminbi as potential alternative reserve currencies, but there's a, there's a, they have a long way to go before they can displace the US dollar uh, in its role as an international currency. But I, this is like, you, you can't take it for granted that things are always going to be the way they are today. You know, there are states of the world that could come about where we get things wrong and that undermines faith in the dollar and then we do get a crisis. But that's not something, uh, th th these, are, these are eminently manageable problems if you know, sensible people can agree on sensible fixes. You know, the last time we had a high level of debt was after World War II when we figured out how to pay that down without any kind of crisis. Now we're now looking at a much, I mean, we're kind of, we're basically at that level now. And the question is, can we kind of bring things under control before we go way, way, way beyond that level? Um, All right, well, wonderful, Mark, thank you. Um, we have no more questions in the queue. So that concludes your presentation, Mark, that was, an incredible amount of information and um and it was very insightful i i thoroughly enjoyed it i really appreciate it so very well done even though you thought you were rusty i wouldn't i wouldn't have known <laughs> thanks can i just mention one last thing uh, my my colleague just asked me to mention this um you, we have this global perspectives speak, speaker series that we've run out of the bank um it's online now and next week we'll be hosting claudia Aguirre from baker ripley if any of your um, audience wish to join, it's it's a free online event. I think it's next Wednesday, but again, you'll see details at dallasfed.org. Uh, it's a one hour Q&A with um, her and Rob Kaplan, just talking about issues surrounding community development and so on. So you can find that on your website? Yeah, yep. It's under Global Perspectives, yep. Okay. Well, and we, we, we have uh, like all kinds of different speakers in for that, but if y'all, anybody's interested, just go there to sign up. Um, and we're lining up another interesting group of speakers for the fall so that's great thank you we'll we'll promote it through our channel okay thank you you're welcome all right mark well thank you it was a pleasure uh getting
getting to meet you and I thank you for uh, picking up Patrick's slack. Um, and so uh, you, it was wonderful. So have a great day and we'll do oh. this again. Yeah, hope to do it in person next year. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. All right, bye.